Hey, yo. It's the Life Shot Podcast. Change your world and change the world. Helen Clare uh, from Run Better With Yoga. It's good to have you on the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, is it sweltering hot in Cornwall as it is here in the east of England? Oh, it is. Cornwall is amazing today. Yeah, I have to yeah. spend a bit of time in the garden today. It is stunning. I know. It's, it's beautiful, but I'm actually whew, a bit hot in my office. No, it's too hot. Oh. <laughs> it's better warm than cold, though, I think. So I, I think um, what would be good for our listeners and our viewers is to get a background of, um, you know, who Helen Claire is, the business that you set up, because um, it's, it's quite in, inspiring to see your posts on, on Instagram. That's where I found, uh, that's where I started following you and saw your different posts and like are uh, quite jealous as to where you're running on these beautiful hillsides and seasides. What, what, what was it like growing up? Um, where did you grow up? And then also what led you into this uh, path? Okay, sure. Wow, that's quite a story. So I actually grew up near where you are now. So I grew up in Essex um, up until I went to university. And then I did a lot of traveling. Um, and I started practicing yoga around that time. So my early 20s was when I started practicing yoga. Um, throughout my youth, just to back up, I was a competitive swimmer. So I came to yoga from quite an athletic background. And I wanted to use it as a way of kind of balancing out all the sort of athletic and endeavors and training side of things that I was doing. I ended up living in Japan for a year after university. And that's sort of the time where I started to get further into the meditation side of, of yoga and, and start to really experience it for the more well-rounded well -round practice that it is. Traveled for a few more years longer. I started running a lot more than swimming. Running is much easier to do where whilst you're traveling, you can do it anywhere. And then I ended up down in Cornwall. I've been in Cornwall for 10 years now. Um, just before I arrived here, I trained as a yoga teacher. So I trained as a yoga teacher up in Scotland after all my traveling through Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Um, came down to Cornwall and that's where I started teaching. I started working with a lot of runners here and, and that's where Run Better Video has kind of grown from over the last 10 years. It sort of evolved uh, into what it is today, but taking my athletic background, um, really um, going deep into my yoga practice and then seeing what I can share with people. And, um, and now what I love to do the most is help runners to run better using a lot of the principles from yoga. So helping them to avoid injury and helping them to run in a much more natural way. Um, and a lot of that can, can come from their yoga practice. And less injuries, I suppose. What? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so tell us about your business. So you say it's been going 10 years. Um, what, what is it like in the beginning? And has there been a, a, a rise or has there been a steady growth? What, what's gone What's it yeah, like? I think there has been, a, there's definitely been a growth and an interest in yoga over the last 10 years. I think there's no denying that. And I think um, from a personal point of view, when you're growing a business in a, in a location, people start to hear about you. And that's another reason why your business is going to grow. So yes, my classes have definitely grown in size over the years. And um, it is lovely to have word of mouth recommendations and yeah, so I have, I have a lot of students now and I get to see a lot of students on a one-to-one -one basis as well as in group classes and I obviously offer my retreats down here as well. So do people travel to your retreats from around the country? Yeah, they do. Yeah, from around the country and from around Europe as well. So I recently had a few people over from Belgium and Holland um, and definitely all around the UK. I've done a couple of retreats over in Portugal as well, where we've had international students there as well. And so how are you um, with your, you're having a bit of, I saw your website, you've got a bit of a digital business going on as well. Are you offering uh, videos online? And Yeah, so I mean, as part of my weekly blog, I send out a free video each week, and that's Yoga for Runners, um, a specific aspect of yoga that can, they can do at home, or sometimes a running tutorial. And then, I've, yeah, I've started this digital aspect of the business to try and help more people experience this run better with yoga. Um, 
side of things that I do. So yeah, I have an online program now called Get On Track that I have people around the world using and really getting a lot of benefit from. So the reason I ask is because um, it would be good to get some of your business advice, shall we say, Uh, because there's a few people doing this type of thing. And obviously there's um, the market's wide open. Um, There's a lot of need for online training, for example. Uh, I'm going to be also providing some video training on, on my platform under my personal brand. So what kind of advice can you give to, for people who are just starting out They they want to do this, uh, you know, e-learning or video series, what, what's the first step that they've got to take? Uh, the number one thing has to be your free content. So make sure you're offering something free and valuable every single week. So whether that's a blog post or a podcast, like what you're doing or a video in my case. So people have to be able to see that that you have something really valuable to offer and then they're going to start following you and hopefully eventually sort of go further with you and and perhaps buy a product or course. It's about getting that brand loyalty first. Yeah. Yeah. Giving some value. Yeah. You've got to show people what you've got and what you can offer and they have to start to um, know, like, and trust you. Yeah. Building that trust is, uh, is, is a big thing, isn't it? Yes. So I had some questions lined up. Um, thanks for telling us about yourself and it's great to get to know you. Uh, so <laughs> I, I want to know that uh, the, the, the benefits to the cardiovascular system, um, also, right. also the, the benefits to your mental um, and, and uh, your, your physical being with, with running. So, it, yeah. you know, because you hear a lot about running being bad for the knees um, cardiovascular is not that good anymore because you hear you always hear conflicting advice, don't you? And as the years go on, um, advice changes. What? Well, what's uh, for, uh, as for because yours is called running uh, better with yoga. Mm. How? Uh, what do you? What do you got to say about running in particular and cardiovascular? Okay. Well, just first off, running should not hurt your knees. If it does hurt your knees, you're not running in the right way. So that's one of the main things I help people do. I help them to get strong and mobile and flexible so that they can run with correct alignment. Then you won't get any pain or a way less risk of injury. Um, As for cardiovascular, I I believe that we definitely need a cardiovascular element. We have to have that in order to have sufficient fitness to strengthen the heart, um, improve that whole... um, you know, the blood pumping system, it lowers our cholesterol and it lowers our blood pressure, uh, can strengthen our immune system. So I think it's definitely still an essential part of our, what we need to include in our weekly, daily activities. So would that look like doing a bit of strength training, um, but not totally neglecting high uh, cardiovascular, kind of like, you know, breathing really heavy type stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, what I teach, I teach runners how to, um, you know, I teach them yoga routines that are strengthening and mobilizing. So that might be something they do in the morning, they get their strength work, they might do a longer strength um, session on a day when they're not running, or they might do a shorter one and then go for a run, they get their heart rate up, they're working their respiratory system and they're getting the body moving. And then after that, they might do a post run yoga session which is going to be a recovery session and get to strength and stretch out release the the muscles and the tissues then Hmm. Uh, i've been listening to uh, dr joe dispenza and i haven't yet got to the part of his book where he talks about walking meditation and it just it just sprung to mind and i don't i don't know but you tell me (laughs) is there (laughs) such a thing as running meditation i don't know yeah (laughs) yeah yeah so when you get into the flow of it yeah becomes like a moving meditation yeah and i think for me i have to be here in cornwall on the coast path where there's no one else around and i have just the wildlife and the ocean crashing against the cliffs and i don't have to think about anything else i can just go into my rhythm and sort of flowing over the the coastal path and flowing with the environment and it becomes this sort of really peaceful calming state of mind so that i would relate to and call that a bit of a moving meditation Moving meditation. And what if, what if people aren't in such a beautiful part of the world? What do you suggest? Yeah, that's, I mean, 
that's a good question because I know not everybody is fortunate as I am to live here in Cornwall, but um, I, I would say that you can probably still find at least an element of that. I mean, most cities are going to have a park at least to run around. I know a lot of people who actually prefer to run on roads. So it's, it depends on your personal preference and, and maybe there's sort of this rhythmical um, sense of running on a flat road just with that buzz of the traffic in the background you know maybe that could be meditative as well mm. and we've all got to experiment and um, but give it a chance you know you've got to get into it and you have to be able to run in a comfortable way if we're dealing with injuries and niggles and complaints it's not going to be quite such a meditative experience is it yeah because you don't want to be thinking about pain in your joints uh, when you're trying to zone out in a way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so deal with that first, <laughs> learn to run properly, and then, then it can become really, really enjoyable. So what are, the, what are the, some of the things that you would do for somebody who might come to you with, they might say, yeah, I really want to do this, but I have had knee problems in the past or hip problems. Yeah. What are some yeah. of the exercises that you give them? Oh, well, it can vary so much from person to person, which is why I love to work on a one-to-one -one basis most of the time. So I would run someone through um, a series of very simple tests. You know, I would test the strength of particular muscles, particularly around the hips. Um, I would test for tension and over-tightness in the muscles, again, particularly around the hips. And then I'd watch and observe them in a simple yoga routine, and I can see further where areas of of potential weakness and potential tightness are. And then I can tailor a yoga sequence to suit them where we're gonna strengthen the areas that they need to strengthen and, and release tension in those other areas where they need to do that. Do they get like almost immediate feedback from doing these exercises? Because I'm thinking it's hard work sometimes, right? And, and if they don't see results, they, you, might be ten, you might tend to give up. Have yeah, you had that? so um, in many cases you can see results really quickly just from a session or two. Depends on the situation, obviously, but if there's like a real, um, um, either weakness or tightness, you'll start to see results quite quickly. Mm. Uh, for other people, you know, it might take a few weeks, but um, all my students have seen positive results. So what, what's the mental, what do you say? The, what does it take mentally to do this? Because it's, it's, it's one thing to say, all right, do this stretch. But sometimes that's hard. Um, yeah. Sometimes it takes more than just trying to do it. How do you teach them mentally to go beyond and, and really push past the limit? I think um, where yoga is different to just doing a series of stretches is that it does encompass much more than just the stretches. You, you make it part of your, your routine. It involves breathing, finding focus and awareness, really becoming aware of your whole body and feeling what's happening. And that process can become really enjoyable and very calming. Um, and, and there's that relaxation element of it as well. So I help people to come up, well, I make a sequence for someone and then I suggest how they can make it part of their routine. And if you can start to implement it at the same time, regularly each day or every other day, whatever, um, it becomes more of a habit. And because you're getting more from it than just doing a stretch, you're getting all the other benefits of um, um, enhanced awareness, um, like the mental benefits, more clarity, you're getting the relaxation side as well. It becomes more enjoyable pro process and you know you can feel more benefit i think when you yeah. feel real benefit from something then you have motivation to continue yeah what's going on in my head is almost like um this 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 world where people come to you every morning and you kind of like their guide and then they do the yoga with you you know like the old aerobics thing where you go to a class and everyone just follows the leader is it <laughs> is it similar to that or do you just say hey guys come for a few sessions this is the routine and you've got to go and do it at home uh, what does it look like for you? Um, so if I, if I do a weekly class, which I do do, I have weekly students, they come see me every week, I will lead the class and I'll walk around as I'm teaching and I will help people as I'm teaching them through the sequence. So that's a little bit different. They are following my instructions for an hour and a half through that class. 
if I see someone on a private individual basis, so they've come to me perhaps with, a, with an injury or past injury and I'm trying to help them through something, then I'll give them a personal sequence and, and then I'll send them home with that sequence with suggestions of how to implement it and I'll stay in touch with them throughout the week to kind of motivate them and answer any questions that they have and then we'll meet up the following week and, and we'll see what differences there are and I'll do some other tests and I can tweak and modify the sequence that they have. Mm. And then on a retreat, you know, I get to spend longer with, with the group. So I see them for a, a morning strengthening and mobilizing session and in the evening for this relaxing session and then get to speak to them individually in between about their own little individual things. So, so that's a lovely experience because you get to spend much longer with someone and learn more about how you can help them. And the relationships are strengthened then. People get yeah. to know you better. Great way to build rapport with your you're following right yeah 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 and it's lovely to spend that time with people especially if, you know they've been coming back for retreats for a few years or if you know mm. someone's been following you online for a while yeah so um how has this type of training because you've, you've been doing this the yoga thing and the running has it helped you to overcome any challenges in your life where you could say you know, this is really this doing this type of thing has really helped me to overcome this this challenge. Is there anything that you that comes to mind? I, I don't think I've had any major challenges to overcome in life, but I know that both the yoga and the running seems to have enhanced my life greatly. Like I can't imagine the life without them, um, and I know that. There's definitely been a mental and emotional shift since I started practicing yoga. I think yoga has this amazing um, ability to allow you to just kind of step back and become, well, you become more mindful. You start to observe yourself more from within and you start to respond more carefully to, to other people and throughout life rather than reacting <clears throat> instantly. So there's definitely been that that I've noticed. Um, and similarly with running, we, we already talked about that moving meditation element. You get to go out and just run and, and then everything feels much better after. That's brilliant. Um, let's, let's go on to nutrition. Do you have advice to give our listeners as to what you think? Um, there's lots of different advice out there now. You get the, uh, you get the keto, which is like, well, it's good for some people, but maybe not for others. Some people need carbohydrates, maybe. Um, and there's a lot of like the paleo diets and there's, uh, uh, there's so much different advice out there about mm -hmm. what we should be eating and, you know, vegan diet. So, and I spoke to a guy from the original gym here, John Nicholson, and he said, um, his advice was simple and it didn't really have any kind of rules about it. It was just eat, uh, as much as you can whole processed, sorry, whole natural food, not processed food. Right. <laughs> and, um, but uh, he didn't mention anything about meat and uh, fish and all that. But what, what if, uh, as far as nutrition goes, to make sure that your body is uh, primed, you know, uh, in tune as in best performance, what, what, what do you think? So my opinion and in my experience from both personal experience and my experience from seeing results in my students, I recommend a plant-based whole foods diet. So it's a vegan diet. But rather than just using that word vegan, we say plant-based whole foods. So um, completely natural foods, unprocessed, um, <clears throat> lots of high alkaline foods to keep our pH levels up. If we allow our pH to drop too much and become too acidic, then that's when we're at much higher risk of... Um, what would those foods look like, the, the high alkaline ones? You want high alkaline foods, which are really dark leafy greens. Spinach, um, and, kale. Yeah, spinach and kale in particular, uh, spring greens, that kind of thing. And then, but then all sorts of other vegetables as well. Fruits so, for our carbohydrates. But what, what, I found this difficult because I wake up in the morning and I want to follow this. I, I've, been, I've been challenged to try the vegan diet. I did it for a few weeks and I was like, oh, I just, I just want a rump steak on the, on the barbecue, you know, <laughs> but then, <laughs> then I think, let me try the keto. Um, and then the key, it's also difficult because I wake up in the morning. I'm like, okay, uh, cereal, mm, no 
Cyril's not going to work. It's processed, first of all. And, and then I think, okay, let me try. If I was on a vegan diet, what would I, like having eggs is not an, is not an option really. But no. so you kind of like, so breakfast is quite a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, what do you have for breakfast on your mornings? Well, for breakfast, I do tend to have porridge most mornings. So I try and find the most unrefined oats that yeah. I can. And then I put in chia seeds for protein. So I think that's a good breakfast. That's a good breakfast, uh, yeah. Yeah. Or um, if you have the time to make a chia seed pudding, you just like, to soak your chia seeds, coconut milk overnight, then that's also a great, really high protein breakfast. And that no sugar. No sugar. That's tough. <laughs> Maybe some like, date syrup. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so you recommend the vegan diet and has that not hindered you in a, the physical way as in like doing sporting things. So it doesn't, you don't lack energy. You feel, no, you feel that your vitamin. My energy. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You get enough protein in there. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. We absolutely. Don't need to eat meat for protein. We get more than, enough protein from a well-balanced plant-based diet and we need to think about um also digestion and if we can eat foods that digest easily then we are left with more energy so if you go and eat your rump steak that's going to put a lot of effort on your digestive system that's going to digest that with left, less energy so yeah. if we can eat something that's much much easier to digest like vegetables then we have much more energy to, to go and run with yeah. So I was, um, I read the, the Sadhguru book, uh, in engineering and he mentioned that, that fact that he said, um, when you, when you eat a raw vegetable, it digests, uh, in, in a quicker time than a cooked vegetable, which I thought, I think he said that, which is quite an interesting thing. He said that fruits and vegetables, uh, digest within two hours in the system. So that's very quick and mm -hmm. that we should chew our food a lot as much yeah. as we can so that our stomach doesn't have to do as much work. Yeah. I thought it was uh, interesting advice. Um, and I've, I have seen the results myself where I've eaten um, like vegetables and I find that my energy is good after a, a while, but you don't get that immediate satisfaction of eating like, let's say a donut, for example, you know, <laughs> you, you don't get that immediate rush. And, and maybe it's an emotional thing. Do you think that we like, like emotionally attached to our food in a way, we've got maybe a bad relationship with, with food? Yeah, I think many, many people have an emotional attachment to food for sure. And that can take a while to get over. And perhaps it's not, perhaps it shouldn't be a case of, you know, cutting off the stuff that you love and enjoy all, you know, 100% straight away, but doing it gradually. I think cutting down on those high sugar foods gradually is going to be a much easier process. Mm. You're not cutting yourself off straight away, but you're starting to feel the benefit of more doing of that. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how long have you been doing that, that vegan diet? Uh, almost 10 years. 10 years. And that's about as long as you've had your business going, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was mainly vegetarian before that. Then um, when was vegetarian for... I guess a couple of years and then it just kind of came around about naturally really it I just felt like I naturally didn't want to eat dairy anymore um realized that I was that then sort of living pretty much a plant-based diet <laughs> yeah, excellent so, <laughs> so um what's the w let's talk about um getting older now okay so, oh, uh, do have to? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about getting older and also how that how do you see like the future going for yourself doing this type of exercise? Um, I mean, is there like, oh, I'm going to stop when I'm 70 or I'm going to stop when I'm 80. How do you, how do you see yourself aging in this process? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> Cause I have thought about that actually. Um, I, I, I can't see myself stopping what I'm doing for a long, long time. And I would like to think that I'm still, definitely practicing yoga through my 70s and 80s uh, and possibly even still teaching it you know i know plenty of yoga teachers that have gone in through their 70s into their 80s and still been teaching yoga it has it, i think it does have a way of keeping you young so fingers crossed that happens for me as well um, and and running as well i know plenty of runners who are running into their older ages i think if you have that 
um, that proper efficient strength and mobility, you've looked after yourself, you've eaten the right foods, then there's absolutely no reason why you would need to stop running. Because running is a natural thing to do, obviously, isn't it? You know, we were made to be able to run and move across the land. So, mm. yes, we're going to get older, obviously, and that is going to have its effects. And we might start to run a bit less or a bit slower, yeah. less often. But I can definitely see myself still running. Yeah, definitely to 80, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not giving up. And uh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, I think you've done well in your, in your business to take, to, to obviously have these retreats, have people around go digital as well. Is there, is there a plan uh, for the business to go into different areas or expand or is it, are you happy that uh, at the moment it's, you know, it is as it is. Um, it, it, it's going to expand, but within what I have already. So I'm going to stay with my retreats, but my retreats might go to some different venues. Um, they might, I might adjust the content. I regularly do um, long weekends here in Cornwall. So, you know, maybe I'm going to extend them to four weeks because there's a lot I want to teach on the long weekend. So particularly this year, I felt like, oh, I needed more time. So I might extend those. Um, so I've just launched my first online course and I'm about to film my second online course. So that's going to be launching in October. Um, and then I have ideas for another one for next year. So retreats and online courses but um just giving people more value and, and looking at what my students really need and then mm. finding a way to offer them that so so what is it that you want to teach people at these retreats you said you didn't have enough time what is it that you think you missed out what's the most important things that you want to get across oh. to people <laughs> there's, there's just um a lot that we can cover in terms of the yoga practice and different ways of practicing to um, that I want to share with people that and that is going to ultimately enhance their running ability and obviously you are never going to be able to teach everything on a retreat a retreat is always going to be a different amount of time mm. and the idea really with it is to inspire people to continue with it yeah. but on these retreats as well as the yoga there's also the running workshops and it was quite hard to fit in all the elements of natural running that we want to cover in a long weekend space of time so just having maybe a bit more time for that would get people or just offer people more to take away with i interviewed um a lady joyce crawford she did the oh, i always forget the name now they walk 100 miles in 24 hours and and i spoke to her about that about the mental challenge of doing that race over 24 hours and trying to stay awake and, and walk right. and get there in time. Uh, and then I spoke to her about, um, she does nature walks all the time. So always walking out in nature. I'm interested in, in that connection we have with nature. Um, I, I just wanted to explore that a little bit with you um, mm -hmm. be, before we go is to, how important is it and what, what benefits do we get from being out in nature? Do we, do we have to think about it differently? Do we have to take our shoes off and walk on the ground sometimes? I mean, what do we need to do? <laughs> well, I think if you have the opportunity to go barefoot outside whenever you can, I would. From the physical perspective of strengthening your feet, I think that's absolutely a great idea. Um, but if you don't want to go barefoot and it's not always practical to do so, just being outside in nature has incredible benefits to your overall well-being. So it, it's definitely been shown that being outside in nature boosts our mental well-being. It boosts our this sort of kind of this inner joy that we have. It makes us feel happier. Hmm. Um, what do you put it down to? Is it a reason for that or is it just we, we can't put our finger on it? What is it? Why does it do it to us? <laughs> I don't know exactly why nature yeah. has that effect on us. I think we could maybe maybe find out, but I think it's <laughs> I would say it's where we're meant to be. We're not really meant to be cooped up in boxes, are we? In buildings. Yeah, I like that. We're outside in nature, and I think that's our, our natural habitat and that connection with with wildlife and with trees and feeling the grass and listening to the ocean and feeling the sunshine. Um, 
all of that together has an incredible gives us an incredible boost yeah because i um, i think that the very fact that we need to breathe every few seconds shows our reliance on nature um yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. the fact that the trees give us oxygen and we give them back carbon dioxide it's a beautiful relationship wow. yes yeah that's exactly <laughs> what it is the relationship yeah so helen it's been great talking to you uh, oh thank you it's been uh, great to talk to you. yeah I'll, mm-hmm. i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna put your links on um on the on the youtube description so for anybody watching uh on youtube or on the podcast just check out the description we'll, we'll get some links to um helen's uh, business and uh, go for a retreat in Cornwall. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how much uh, if they get booked up pretty quickly. Do they get uh, do they get full quite quick, Helen? Uh, they they do tend to spell up pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah. So dates for next year will be up uh, in the autumn. So September or October time. I'll release twenty twenty dates then. Oh, so you have to, so people have to wait a whole year pretty much if they if they want to join. Uh, well, there'll be two or three <laughs> retreat retreats on next year, but um. Yeah, just a couple of months to wait to find out when the dates are to book. And how do people follow you? What's the best way? I mean, what's the, the single point to say, hey, I want to get hold of Helen. If they don't click on the link, uh, where would they look for you? Uh, well, best place is the website, runbetterwithyoga.com. Yeah. Otherwise, Instagram, at runbetterwithyoga. I'm on there regularly. So you got that name uh, nailed. It's like, yeah, this is it. Run better with yoga. Nailed yeah, it. that's it. Yeah, <laughs> nice and clear to the point. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Helen, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for being on the Live Shot podcast. Thank you so much.